welcome back to another edition of the Prepper Recon Podcast. Our mission is to bring you great interviews with preppers from around the world so you can be better informed and better prepared for everything from a hurricane to the end of the world as we know it. I've been purchasing gold and silver from JM Bullion since before they were a show sponsor because they had the lowest overspot price of any dealer I've been able to find. JM Bullion now offers free shipping on all orders and Prepper Recon podcast listeners will get $5 off any order over $300. Just go to jmbullion.com and use coupon code PR5 at checkout. Hey Preppers and Patriots, American Meltdown, the long-awaited sequel to American Exit Strategy, is now available in Kindle and paperback. In American Meltdown, book two of the Economic Collapse Chronicles, the new president, Anthony Howe, signs an executive order banning all semi-automatic weapons. Matt, Adam, and Wesley Baer begin training with their local militia for the battle that is coming. Within weeks of the inauguration, the $700 trillion derivatives bubble pops when rates on U.S. debt skyrocket. The derivatives crisis is the final nail in the coffin of the banking system and the death of the fiat currency system in America. With the dollar gone, commerce comes to a screeching halt. While times prove to be tough for all, survival favors the prepared. Get your Kindle or paperback copy of American Meltdown, book two of the Economic Collapse Chronicles, on Amazon today. Today's guest is David Kobler, a.k.a. Southern Prepper One. David, thanks for coming back on the show. Thanks for inviting me back. Oh, absolutely. It's a, it's a pleasure to have you back on. Now, I thought today we'd talk a little bit about selecting uh, retreats. And because everyone's sort of in a different situation, today I'd like to talk about homesteads versus bug out locations. And then also for those who maybe can't afford to do either, I'd like to talk about hunkering down and making the most of whatever resources might be available, even in a urban environment. Definitely, definitely. So first, let's start with the ideal scenario. Let's say person number one is either retired or maybe they have a home-based Internet business or, or you know, they can just live just about anywhere with a, a good Internet connection. For the person in that ideal position and can just pick up and move, Where do they start, and what areas of the country do you like uh, for purchasing a homestead? Every person, this is going to be a different answer. I tell people, go to where you have a support structure. Um, There's some people on the East Coast that say, i got to move out West. Uh, You know, i got to go to Montana, which for some people that could be fine. But for the average person, it's not. Um, They could be leaving, you know, relatives that would support them. Even if they're not preppers, you still have a support structure. So look at where you have a support structure. If you don't have a support structure, can you move into one that is already there? Um, Is there a prepper community that will take you in, that will help you? Uh, And that's what I say. Move to where there's people. In in a collapse, you know, you can stockpile a certain amount of food and all the other good stuff, preppers stockpile. But there's something to have other people, a community, uh, a wealth of information. and skills you don't have, you're going to need that. So I tell people, Move where you have a support structure. Now, if that support structure is in the country, that's even better. Um, so look at that. Also look at what you're planning on surviving. Some people say, I'm worried about a tsunami. I'm worried about earthquakes. I'm worried about economic collapse. You have to write down what you're trying to prepare for on a piece of paper so you can make sure your retreat location will address that. Now, do politics and economics matter when you're selecting selecting a homestead? Should a person consider state and local firearms laws maybe and, and maybe the fiscal responsibility of the state and the, the local government when they're selecting their homestead? Definitely. Everything will play in a part, uh, especially economics. Uh, you might be moving to a state that is close to bankrupt, so you're going to inherit some problems just because you're a citizen of that state. Uh, definitely look at the gun laws. Uh, I, I look at... Uh, are they friendly to preppers? Are they friendly to uh, uh, people with independent mind thinking? Um, so look at all that because you're going to be a citizen of that area or that state, and so you want to move to a place that's going to be uh, conducive to prepping. Yeah, I think Detroit's probably a good example of somewhere that had a lot of fiscal uh, problems, and that's that's turned into real safety issues for, for people that live in that city. Because uh, I think it's 58 minutes for high priority 911 calls to respond. So, you know, if you have a, a fire or a heart attack or 
a home invasion, uh, you're probably not going to, you're either not going to survive 58 minutes waiting for, for, uh, emergency services to respond, or if it's a fire, your house is, you know, they're not going to be able to do anything except sweep up the ashes after 58 minutes. Correct. And, and a lot of people are elderly, uh, you know, they're, they're in their prime of life financially where they have a little bit of money that can move. But also, this is when they're having some health issues. So if you do have health issues, don't move to the, you know, the middle of nowhere, because if you have a slight problem, it could turn into, you know, a serious problem for you. So look at that. You know, where is the uh, EMS coming from? Do they have to drive two hours to get to me, or are they 30 minutes away? So look at that if you have health issues. Also look at it. You, you might be visiting a doctor a lot. So someone going two mi- or two hours away, you know, once a week to go to their doctor, you know, that's not going to be a good quality of life. You're, you're not going to love doing that. So you might have to settle on a little different location but be closer to some of the medical necessities you might need. And how much land do you need to sustain a family of four if you're looking to produce 100% of your, your own uh, food? That is a tricky question because I don't think really uh, in today's society we could produce 100% without some outside assistance. I know a lot of people say, well, I have chickens and rabbits, and they are also going to the store and buying the chicken feed, the rabbit feed, and and supplement things to keep those animals running. So it's really hard to be 100%. So what I tell people, look for a community that is already producing a lot of food. Um, That way, when you go there, there is a means to feed yourself outside your own little homestead. Um, now, look for, you know, if you move to the wheat belt and, and all they do is wheat, that's not what you're wanting. You want to mix. You want people to have orchards, they have ponds for fish, uh, a lot of gardens, just a mixture of all the food that we like to eat. Um, it's very hard to be 100%. That's why it goes back to community. I don't have a milk cow, but I have a great friend a few miles away that has a milk cow. I have friends that have milk goats. So I might not produce the milk I need, but I can get that milk by trading from my apples or my peach trees. So you might not be 100%. Always try to get to 100%, um, but look at other options for you. And what are some of the natural resources we need to look for when we're selecting a homestead? I think the, the best is what's the soil like? Uh, is it conducive to growing a lot of vegetables and having an orchard, or is it all rock? Um, so look for good soil. Have it tested. Um, also make sure that, you know, 20 years ago that wasn't a dump or there wasn't a chemical plant upstream. Look for the environmental factors that, you know, you want to grow good organic food for your family, but you, you know, you, you pick the bad spot. So look at, is that land good land and, and can I raise enough food off that land? Um, I also would look at wood. Do I have wood for heating? Um, do, do I have other natural resources like, is there an open source of water, a spring, a creek, a pond? You know, in my area, even if you don't have that on your property, they're really close to your property, um, or you can drill a well. But having that open source so you can just go get water, boil it, or some type of purification is a huge plus if the grid goes down or if it's an extended problem. And would you consider concealment sort of a natural resource, whether you mentioned timber, so maybe it's uh, there's a tree coverage, or maybe it's just the way that the land's laid out? And maybe uh, your your home's just not that visible from the road. Would that be a natural resource? And that's that's something that to look definitely, for. That is definitely something security. You, you don't want the perfect homestead retreat, uh, but everyone passing on the road, even if it's just a gravel road that a lot of people don't go on, people will notice what you're doing. So if if you can keep a nice boundary of trees and shrubs and and natural vegetation between your improvements and, and the prying eyes, that is a huge plus. If they don't know you're there, if they don't uh, know what you have, you're you're going to have less security problems. And then you touched a little bit about, uh, you know, make sure that the, the homestead you select is going to be conducive to whatever the thing is that you're you're prepping for. But also on the other side of that, should we also consider the natural threats to that homestead? Should we ask ourselves if the property is susceptible to hurricanes, for forest Definitely. fires, landslides, and earthquakes? Definitely. And a lot of the problems you can deal with, um, you know, if you're in the area with a lot of forest fires, uh, you can put fire breaks. You can design a house that will give you more protection. You can install your own firefighting uh, equipment, you know, a pump and a 5,000-gallon tank on the hill. You can do a lot 
to certain natural disasters. Um, if you're in Tornado Alley, definitely build your house strong. Maybe have a safe room. Uh, so if there is a problem, you can go to a safe location. Natural disasters are probably, you know, most people don't don't treat them all. We're always thinking about the zombie apocalypse or an economic collapse, but it's the little things, those natural disasters, uh, that can, can get you. And what's the minimum distance from a major population center that you would be comfortable with? That, that is a good question. Um, I'm comfortable in my location a little bit closer because I have a, established a community. I, I have, you know, hundreds of people that I can rely on. If I didn't have that, uh, I'd want to be farther away. Um, you know, a lot of people say you need to be a full tank of gas for a car away from a metropolitan area. Um, if, if you could do that, that's great. A lot of people can't do that because they have to be tied in with jobs. Uh, if you're independently wealthy, you can have a beautiful place far away, um, but the average person can't do that. So uh, 20, 30 miles, I would say, is a good distance from a medium city. And then probably farther if you're talking about a large city like New York or Atlanta or oh, LA. Yeah. I, I would like to be hundreds and hundreds of miles away from cities like that, for sure. <laughs> that might just be a good uh, rule of thumb anyway, really, huh? Yes. <laughs> and uh, – What's the minimum distance from a major interstate or a transportation corridor that we should consider for our homestead? I would I would put uh, it'd be miles, definitely miles. But I would look at the terrain. If you're up in West Virginia and you're two or three or four miles, uh, but there's four mountain peaks and valleys, you know that's a little different. If you're on a flat area, you want to be far away. Uh, the farther, the better. Um, and everything's a trade-off. Uh, there's no perfect retreat. Um, so you just you just you know pick and choose what you can live with and will live without. Um, but since it's the, the farther distance from interstate, the better. Uh, the farther from population, because the less people you have to deal with, the less security problems and the less chance of them stripping natural resources that you, uh, your retreat or your community will need. And then you uh, you mentioned making sure that you have community. Are there networks to find established preparedness communities so folks can try to purchase a homestead near like-minded individuals? And uh, what are some other ways to, to find those folks? I would I would just look around. Uh, gun shows, uh, any place that preppers meet, um, I would ask your feed and seed. You might have people that are maybe not actually preppers, but they just live a, a homesteading life. I have a lot of people around me you know, are not preppers, and they don't call themselves preppers, but they are. So uh, for look for like-minded people, and they don't have to call themselves preppers. And, and you also have to think, you know, a lot of people think that preppers are right-wing fanatics or on the right of things. There's a lot of people that, you know, are doing a lot of prepping-related things on the other side. You have a lot of people, I, I, let me call them hippies, but they're not really hippies. They're more environmentalists. They're more into organic gardening. And, and those people have skills. So, you know, it's not a left or a right. Just look for people that want to produce food and, and live a simpler life. Yeah, well, unfortunately, probably not a lot of the folks on the left listen to my show anymore. I think I've pretty much ticked them all off <laughs> numerous <laughs> numerous times, but just in case. <laughs> but maybe meetup yeah. might be a good place to, to meet people. I found a good uh, organic gardening uh class that was free in my area uh, through meetup and i just found a really a, a small a small group that's meeting at my church that are yeah. it's sort of a mix of of folks that are uh paying paying attention to the economic situation and uh and uh and looking into uh maybe some of the things that the government's not doing that maybe aren't on the up and up and and also some preppers so it's sort of a it's sort of a big tent of the people that are going there but and it's not very many people but uh but I just found I just found out about this group at my church awesome yes uh it's going to take people and community because no one can know every skill that you need especially to survive an economic collapse uh, your car might break and you don't have the money to take it to repairman, but you got someone in your group that can say, hey, I can fix it, go buy the parts, and we can get you running. Now, what are some of the, the easy-to-grow staple crops that either provide a lot of nutritional value or a lot of calories? Uh, I, I think corn is very important. Um, definitely wheat. 
my philosophy on wheat is I, I grew wheat one time um, and harvested it. It was work beyond belief. So what my philosophy now is on wheat, because it is so cheap and it stores for such a long time, I stock multiple, multiple, multiple years of wheat if, if there was an economic or a, 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 a crisis or a collapse. So wheat to me is I have a ton of it. Um, definitely corn. Definitely you can do a lot of things with corn. I can feed my chickens. I can uh, use it for my own consumption. And then I just like variety. I, I like to know where every nut tree in the wood, woods are because nuts are very important. And this year I'm going to be growing some peanuts. Uh, in South Carolina they grow pretty well. Uh, so I'm going to try peanuts for the first time ever. My neighbor grows them, and I had some of his, and I, I thoroughly enjoyed them. They were just raw. They weren't roasted, and they were very good. So to me, I'm into variety now, um, from asparagus to, to more the merrier. And are the peanuts are pretty easy to grow? He says they're very easy to grow. Um, so I am going to try it this year and, and grow a small, small, you know, plot of peanuts and see how they go for me. And you get a lot of good proteins and uh, healthy fats and, and a lot of things from peanuts. That's a really a, a, a superfood, really. Yes. In my community and just with a few neighbors, we've talked. Uh, and he's going to be our peanut man. If, if everything collapses tomorrow, he's going to be the peanut man. And he's going to try to grow enough for everyone. We're going to grow our own, but he has a specialized in peanuts. My other friend, a mile away, is going to specialize in potatoes. Um, and I'm specializing in some, I have some fruit trees, especially peaches. So that way, um, I can trade my peaches for peanuts and potatoes. Um, it, and that's what we're trying to do. I'm going to grow my own potatoes, but not as much as I, I would. And you mentioned that, that it's easier to just buy the wheat and store it than it is to actually produce it. Uh, especially Definitely. right now, rice might be another one of those things Definitely that it's, it's right. so cheap to cheap. buy right a twenty pound a twenty pound bag of rice for seven dollars at, at Walmart. You throw it in a yep. mylar liner and throw it in a five gallon bucket and forget about it until the zombies come. Really, and it's yep. it, it, you're out nine bucks with the with the mylar liner in the bucket yep. for twenty pounds. And oatmeal. Oatmeal yeah. is another good thing that I, I enjoy oatmeal in the mornings. I eat it probably two or three times a week. So that's something I have a ton of, but I'm also trying to rotate it through. And what's some easy-to-raise livestock that you can recommend for us uh, when we're first starting out? Chickens. I think chickens are the most enjoyable, and they give you something every day. Uh, when they get to that age, they're laying eggs. Um, you're getting eggs every day, so you're getting something from them. Uh, I think the next thing that I would raise would be rabbits. Uh, New Zealand whites are what I've had, and... Um, they're excellent. The proficient breeders, plus they have a great uh, uh, meat-to-feed ratio. So, you know, you get a lot out of your feed because feed's important. Um, you just can't give your rabbit, I mean, you can give it just, you know, hay or grass. It needs a good protein to produce a lot of offspring. So you have to remember that you have to have something with protein to feed them to get the maximum output from your rabbit. Um, and then it's... You know, you have cows, you have pigs, you have bigger animals. It's very hard for a lot of people to raise those because they don't have the land. They don't have the, you know, the space designed for that. Um, I, I think rabbits, or excuse me, I think cows are a big security risk. If you have 20 cows in your field, you know, and everyone sees them when they drive by, you know, that's going to be hard to secure in a worst-case event. But if I have 20 breeding rabbits uh, in a barn, no one sees it, it's a lot more secure and it's a lot better. I can easily, um, you know, prepare one rabbit for, for supper tonight. But, you know, when you when you slaughter a 15, 2,000-pound cow, you have to know how to handle all that meat. You have to have a place to preserve it, be it freezing, canning. It's a lot of work. So for me, I prefer smaller animals, um, and that way I don't have to store all this meat after I, after I start butchering. And you mentioned cows, that uh, they can even be a security risk, and then all of the complications of of uh, butchering it and, and figuring out what you're going to do with the meat that you obviously won't be able to eat the same day you, you kill it. Uh, what are some other crops and animals that are more of a challenge and folks should maybe just kind of stay away from until after they've really mastered the basics? And that's what it is. It's mastering the basics. Start off with a, a, a few and, and really get that animal down to before you move on to the next one. And always, the biggest mistake I've seen people do 
is they get an animal and they're not totally prepared for that animal. Chicken coop's not totally done. The rabbit hutches aren't totally done. They get the rabbit, they get the chicken, and then it's a pain for them because they're not prepared. So always be 100% prepared before you bring that animal in. Uh, a lot of people get cows and they just planted their grass the year before and it's not established and the cows, you know, wreck it. The horses wreck their field. So, you know, you have to be totally prepared for that animal. Um, you know, a lot of people like pigs, and there's something to say about, you know, a pound of bacon. You know, a pound of bacon in my book, in, in the end of the world, I will give you up, you know, I'd give you a lot for a pound of bacon because uh, I'm a bacon fanatic. So I think it's just take it slow and don't jump in too fast and get overwhelmed with any type of animal. I hear you on the bacon. I saw somebody posted on Facebook for Valentine's Day. It was roses for a guy. And instead of a rose at the top of the stem, it was a rolled-up piece of cooked bacon. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Now let's talk about yeah. uh, let's talk about person number two. Uh, let's say this person lives in a city and they can't leave because of work, but they want to purchase a bug out location. A lot of the same things that that person number one had to look at, as far as resources and uh, distance and and those types of things, are going to cross over into person number two's decision. But uh, some of the things are going to be quite different. One thing that's going to be different is that person number two isn't going to be able to have active food production because they don't live there. How much long-term food storage do they need to keep on to, to hold them over? until they can start producing their own food? I, I say a minimum a year. You don't know when the crisis will happen. Um, if you can't plant and you're already jumping into your your, your long-term food storage, um, I would say at least minimum of a year. But if you're not actively farming, homesteading, and, and you think, well, I got this, you know, long-term seeds in my, my number 10 can, I'm just going to plant a garden, it doesn't work that way. Uh, Murphy will catch you. You, you will not get what you think you should out of that uh, garden or your animals. So really, homesteading is a daily thing just advancing along. So if you're a new person and you think, well, when I get there, when I bug out to my bug out location, everything's going to be fine. It's not going to be fine. So for you, I'd store a lot more food um, because you might be living off that food if you have a crop failure. And you could just have a crop failure because of the weather. If you have a drought, you have excess water or rain. There's a lot of things that will affect that. So the more food you put back in, and, and it might just be a, a year supply of food, and then just go ahead and just buy extra rice, beans, oatmeal. It won't be the best diet, but it'll keep you alive for the next growing season. And then, like you mentioned, uh, you can't just buy one of those survival seed vaults and keep that at your bug out location and think that you're going to go out there and, and be uh, the Jolly Green Giant the day it hits the fan. Um, there's a learning curve with that too. So, so maybe folks that, that have to do that, they have to purchase a bug out location. You know, maybe even if you just have a little postage stamp size yard, if you can just grow a couple of tomatoes or some basil yeah. plants or something to, to start developing that skill set of, of farming and, and growing things and being used to, uh, you know, seeing what the challenges are to, to have an, a small garden, uh, it's going to help you when you, when you try to transition over. Definitely. It's, it's a huge learning curve, and this is your life that you're dealing with, so uh, you need to practice it. whatever you can do. There's a lot of places where you could join maybe a gardening club in the city. So even if you can't have your own little spot at your house, you're going, you're learning from other people that have been gardening a while, and, and that's prepping. Now, also, since person number two doesn't live there, uh, one of the other challenges they're going to have is their property being exposed to potentially being robbed. Should weapons, Definitely. food storage, and maybe money, gold, silver, things like that, should they be cached in a secret location? And what are some good methods for caching your supplies? Definitely. Um, if the thief can't find it, it's going to be hard to steal it. So a uh, fake wall um, between your floor joists in your basement, um, you can take a PVC pipe and put end caps on it, and you can store a lot of things in there. Put it up and then put your insulation back if you have insulation in your floor. There's a lot of creative ways you can hide your stuff, but definitely hide your stuff. Because, you know, right now people might not break in, but by the time you're traveling in a worst case and it takes you a day or two to get to your bug out location, you know, the neighbors might have already hit your house. So hide whatever you can. Um, I, I like also having enough 
there. A lot of people say, well, I'm going to load my truck up in my trailer and drive, you know, for six, seven hours to my bug out location. There's no guarantee that you're going to have all your stuff with you. You might be stopped. You might be robbed. Um, so I like to have enough at my bug out location. So if you just show up with the clothes on your back, you have enough stashed away here and there uh, that you can survive. Don't rely on getting that vehicle and that full load of supply. Now, yeah, you're going to carry extra supplies with you, and that would be a great benefit and a bonus if you can get all that stuff there. But don't have that as your plan, that you have to get your stuff there or, or you won't have everything you have at your, your bug out location. And what about community? Does person number two have to think about that? And how will it be different for person number two than for person number one? Will person number two that just sort of shows up in this community after it hits the fan, are they going to be viewed as an outsider because they didn't live there full time? They they will. And even if they move there and they live there full time in certain parts of the country, you will still be an outsider. So you have to do you have to work really hard. Um, what you need to do when you're at your bug out location is go see your volunteer fire department. Maybe pick up some donuts and take them down there. Uh, if you're up there on the weekends, find a local church that you attend and attend that on Sunday. So even if you only attend that church one time out of a month, you are starting to build relations. People will notice you. Uh, you know, when, when, when people come around asking for donations, yeah, it's time to throw 20 or 30 or 40 dollars in their pot. Uh, people will remember that, especially in a small community. If they see you're donating to that community, um, you're going to be accepted quicker. Also, go and eat at the local establishment. Say you're there and there's a small little diner, or you could go to McDonald's or Burger King or that small diner. Go to that small diner, sit down, and, and meet the owner. You're going to have better chances of being accepted. That's really great advice. And then I guess it, uh, if you're going there regularly on vacation, it's gonna you're going to be able to do those types of things uh, more often, which if you bought a retreat, you know, it, it, you should probably get somewhere that, that makes a nice sort of a getaway so that you can at least get yep. the dividend of it at being sort of a vacation home uh, between now yep. and, the, and the stuff hitting the fan. And, and, and make sure you buy a place that is not a day or two days away um, because that way, if it's close enough, you can go up there for that long three-day weekend. Um, but if it's so far away that it takes a full day to drive and a full day to drive back, you're not going to go up there as much. And you need to go up there because there's going to be so much work to do um, at your place, your bug out location. So if, if you have to give up a little bit and not get the best location, but it's closer to you and you can get up there more often, I would pick that. And then uh, cost is going to be a factor for a lot of folks on, on trying to buy a bug out location. Now, for the guy that can maybe uh, pile together $10,000, uh, is it worth it for him to buy a couple of acres and a used camper, or should he just sink that money into hardening his his present residence? I would I would it's it's either way, and I would look at it as a security aspect. Um, if my location in the city or the suburban area, I don't really have to worry much about security, but I can't produce food. What I would do is I would take that money and put it into uh, food storage. Um, that's what I would do. Or better yet, find a friend that lives in a safer location and, and bug out to their location. That way you don't have to buy that property. Maybe all you have to do is buy a, a small camper, or maybe they have a garage and you can move into their garage. Um, I, I'm a big fan of people coming to my retreat. The reason is I'm going to have a lot to do at my property. Security is going to be a huge concern. I'm going to need extra bodies. Um and a person that is dedicated and has stocked everything they, they need to stock, I, I want them to come. And, and for my group, my personal group here, there are people, their families already have their year's supply of food at my location. So guess what? Even if they decide not to come, I'm going to have a lot of extra food. Um, so it gives them motivation to come to my place because all of their food, or their long-term food is here. Um, and you know what that tells me? That tells me that they're dedicated to our team, our plan, our retreat group, because they're bringing their stuff here and pre-positioning it. So that's what I would prefer. Find someone you can go to their retreat. Because um, I want people around me, to be honest with you. I don't know everything. So if I had three or four other guys and their families here, it's, it's a big blessing for me because I feel safer and more secure. There's more of us to protect what we have. Uh, let's talk about person number three. So let's say uh, this this person's stuck uh, 
working in the city and just simply can't pick up and move. And maybe this person is just barely scraping by and they just don't have the money to purchase any type of bug out location. What are some of their options? Um, they, they can try to stay in place. Um, that's definitely, uh, and I would, if you don't have the money, I would work on relationship building, getting to know your neighbors, um, spending time, you know, trying to find the best people on the block and, and build relationships if you have to stay in place. Or in, in, if you can't stay in place and you have no money and you have no friends you can go to, what I would do is I would look for a property surrounding you, maybe 50 miles away, 100 miles away. And I would look at a national forest land, state land, or look for those huge lands that are in grants that no one goes on. And I would find a spot so I could bug out. So I already have a place. I know I'm going to bug out to the woods next to the small creek. It's not the ideal place, but it's better to have a plan than just sit there in your house or jump in your car and say, I have to get out of here and have nowhere to drive to. Have a place, even if it's just, hey, I'm going to the big oak tree next to the creek. 100 miles away. And what about maybe moving to a less populated area of the city that you live in? Like, let's say here in Florida, the farther away from the coast you get, the less the population density is. Even in New York City, it's it, you know it's about an hour commute to Jersey where the population is somewhat lower. Although I'd say I agree with New York Governor Cuomo who said conservatives don't belong in New York. <laughs> But if it's at all possible to, to get out of there, I think there are multiple reasons to leave. Uh, Look but, at uh, area line of drift. If I live in a big city and everything's shut down vehicle-wise, look at where people would normally walk out of that city. And don't put your house on that line. So look for places where people would normally not walk, be it uh, up the hills, bad terrain. So you want people, if they're going to leave the city, not to walk by your front door. But maybe even just that that five or ten miles outside of the the main core of the population center is going to provide you somewhat of a buffer to to get away from things. Uh, like you said, just you know, twenty or thirty miles away is great. You, some people may even be able to handle that long of a commute. And if you're yeah. if you're five or ten or twenty or thirty miles away from the 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 center of population, uh, probably home prices are going to be cheaper. Or if you're a renter, rent's probably going to be cheaper. You're probably going to get more area for your money. Uh, and you may be able to get the same size place that you had, and that's going to make up for your extra gas costs of, of the commute that you have. And you may even have a little left over for, for putting back some more, uh, some more preps. Definitely. Definitely. And community is going to be, I'm sorry, go ahead. There's no perfect place. There's no perfect retreat place. You just have to work with what you have available. Um, and don't get to the point and say, well, you know what? I look on YouTube and these guys have these awesome retreats. I can never have that and give up. You know, don't give up. Look for what will fit your budget and, and your lifestyle and what will work for you and your family. But do something. And you mentioned, you know, starting to get to know your neighbors and getting organized with your neighbors. What are some other things that, that folks can be doing to organize their security and uh, food production and medical care right now? Well, the big thing is community, getting people that already do that job, you know, police officers, nurses. They're already experts in their field. Um, so you, you want to have a plan for your community. So, you know, I am not a know-it-all, it, you know, I – Every day I go on, I learn that I don't know anything. Um, so just develop relationships. And, and don't worry if that person's not a prepper. You might say, oh, that guy's not a prepper. No, he's not a prepper, but he's a farmer. You know, he's not a prepper, but he's a doctor. You know, so develop those relationships, too. It doesn't have to be a prepper because when, when the chips are down, he's still going to be a doctor, and he's still going to uh, probably want to help you. And if you've prepared and, and you've stockpiled some basic, you know, gauze and bandages, and you take that to him, and he has the skills in his head, and you have some simple supplies, you know, it, it, you're going to get some care. And now how do we start those conversations to build that community without violating OPSEC and uh, tipping our hand to how well prepared we are? That, that's a good question. Um, being on YouTube, I've tipped my hand a lot, uh, being on Doomsday Preppers a lot. Um, but I can honestly say I am more secure um, by being out there. Um, anywhere I go in my community, I meet people that are preppers. They come up to me and they talk to me. 
Um, so I'm building more relations. I live in a very prepper-friendly area. So what works for me here might not work for you in your community. So be very careful. For me, being open, um, I built a huge support structure. If I lived in New York City, I would not say you know anything to anybody until I really got to know them and really knew that they were a prepper. And uh, back to person number three that that doesn't have the money to buy a, a separate bug out location, and they can't leave the city. Um, since even if they have a yard, their food production is going to be fairly minimal. How much food should that person store up? And should they keep that? Uh, should they keep those? food stores in multiple caches? It, it's always recommended to, you know, don't have all your eggs in one basket. So if you can split up your food a little bit, definitely do that. Um, you might have a garage that you can put some of it. Yes, be careful of the freezing temperatures and the hot temperatures. But if you can spread your food around, uh, the better for you. And, and then how the much should they store? To me, I tell everyone have a year. Now, everyone is different. Some people, you know, six months, some people, hey, I think the economy is going to crash. I want as much as I can. I got two or three years of food for my family. Um, store as much as you can. Food is not getting any cheaper, but make sure you have a plan to rotate it. Uh, and don't buy anything your family doesn't use right now. And don't buy anything that's so short term you bought, you know, 50 cans of peanut butter, but you're only going to use 20 before they expire and become no good. So be wise and uh, rotate. And don't buy 11 gallons of milk, huh? Definitely not. <laughs> Even if the snow is coming. <laughs> well, I guess the only thing that we didn't really cover was security, which we really covered in depth in our last conversation, the last time you were on the show. So I'll have a link back to that episode of the Prepper Recon Podcast, and I'll also have a link to your YouTube channel. Uh, there's Thank so you. much great stuff there. Uh, but now can you tell the folks listening on YouTube, Stitcher, and iTunes uh, where they can find your YouTube channel? Yes, my YouTube channel is Southern Prepper One, all one word with just the number one. Southern Prepper with the number one. David Kobler, thanks so much for taking time to come back on the show. Oh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for letting me back. This episode is brought to you by CampingSurvival.com. Whether your plan is to bug out or bug in, CampingSurvival.com has all of your preparedness needs, including bug out bags, long term storage food, water filters, gas masks, and first aid kits. Check them out online today at CampingSurvival.com. Be sure to enter coupon code PREPPERRECON for a 5% discount on your entire order.